If you've been hanging around my hyperfixation treehouse for long enough, you know I love Cuphead. It's the perfection of the boss rush subgenre, in my opinion, and a distinct fixture among my top 10 video games ever. And no small part of that is the game's unforgettable roster of bosses, brought to life by the game's trademark rubber hose style. Considering boss battles with colorful characters are often my favorite part of video games, and Cuphead is nearly nothing but boss battles with colorful characters, it's a no-brainer that this would hold such a special place in my heart. The characters of Cuphead are just phenomenal, a bombastic and memorable ensemble that exude life with their every gesture. For characters we see very little of outside their designated battle, it's easy to have a pretty vivid idea of how these characters roll. The precious cargo housed in the hive of rumor honeybottoms is protected by an eclectic measure of security and means of defense. Wally Warble's battle dynamic with his own son speaks a good deal about the aviary military, and Calamaria must be incredibly popular considering just how many sea creatures are rushing to her defense, and hey, who could blame them? No small part of the delight of Cuphead is the smorgasbord of fun characters, each one with a totally unique encounter and method of success just awaiting behind the gargantuan amount of art, characterization, and design Studio MDHR has put into each one. What stands out to me the more I consider the matter, though, is the fact that a boss rush particularly suits Cuphead and his ink and paint influence directly because a distinct confrontation to this effect is surprisingly the groundwork for most classic cartoons. Level with me here, certainly not every single cartoon follows this principle, but certainly enough that you could devote a subgenre to fall into what one could call fight cartoons. The distinct premise of two conflicting characters having a simple reason to quarrel and using all their cartoony wiles to get the better of their rival. Just take a moment to recall how many famous cartoon duos are founded on sheer animosity, Mickey and Pete. Bugs and Elmer, Tom and Jerry, Popeye and Bluto, Bugs and Yosemite Sam, Droopy and the Wolf, Bugs and Marvin, Wiley and the Roadrunner, Bugs and Beaky, Bugs and Rocky, Bugs and... LeBron! When the once impossible became absolutely possible to depict on screen via animation, the first outlet many creators sought to exploit was that of over-the-top violence, coupled with the organic character development begotten from placing a character against their foil. Seven minutes isn't ample time to establish a character, but it often goes unsung how much we learn about a character like Elmer Fudd just from how decidedly different he is from Bugs Bunny. This is why putting two characters in a situation that leads to them just beating the snot out of one another is such a tried-and-true cartoon formula. Considering how many popular cartoons are also animals, it was rarely hard to come up with a good reason for a chase to break out with that in mind. A lot of the time, it's something as simple as a character being hungry and wanting to make a meal out of their adversary or take something that belongs to them. That said, even as often as the designated predator character is positioned as the heel or villain of the conflict, it was sometimes easy to sympathize with them, especially if they're the sort to get defeated over and over again. I've noticed a slight reclamation of the more villainous side of these conflicts recently, like a whole generation of kids just got sick of seeing Sylvester get humiliated and mutilated time and time again just for experiencing the same hunger we all do. I think it's actually a testament to how expressive and memorable these characters are from either side of the conflict, that no matter how clearly the character you're supposed to root for holds that position, it's not hard to view the whole cartoon from the point of view of the loser. At a certain at a certain point, it feels more like the characters chase each other out of obligation over truly persisting tension, and the notion of rivalries such as these evolve to resemble sort of a frenemy relationship, which has become a common metapath, taken most literally with Ralph Wolf and Sam Sheepdog, who clock in and out of their vocations as a predator animal and a guard of the prey, and outside of working hours have a cordial relationship despite the cantankerous nature of their working dynamic. Even the creators of these cartoons, as evidenced by that very complex, have grown to feel that every character to endure insane cartoon violence was only acting out of necessity and self-preservation. 
And that remains true in Cuphead. I'm aware I stretch the scope of classic cartoons well outside the rubber hose era that most directly influences Cuphead, but I'd argue that the put-upon and struggling characters of Fleischer's heyday were a template for the organically motivated characters I mentioned before, and that while Depression-era characters are maybe the most direct influence on Cuphead aesthetically, there's still plenty of designs from other eras of cartoons making an undeniable impact on the cast of Cuphead as we know them. A slew of debtors who owe their souls to the devil and are pursued by the player, controlling Cuphead to collect them in order to save his own skin. The fact that just about every character in Cuphead owes their soul to the devil is a pretty on-the-nose succession of the status of most Depression-era characters, as most Rubberhose protagonists were, just like their creators in the early 30s, down on their luck and hurting for work and money during one of the most devastating economic recessions ever. Most characters acted out of desperation and paid a price for their gamble, just like many people during the Great Depression, and just like the bosses fought by Cuphead and Mugman. We never see explicitly how or why these characters wound up indebted to the devil, but their rich environments and tactics of battle leave plenty to the imagination, while also suggesting a good deal. Many of the characters are surrounded by contraptions and weapons, or fantastical powers, which I always imagined were the spoils of the devil's resources for which they owe him. There's no doubt left as to what each character's passions, endeavors, and hobbies are thanks to the expressive animation and detailed surroundings. It's easy to imagine how a sizable loan would benefit them. I'm sure many denizens of Depression America would give a good deal for the theatrical dressings boasted by Sally Stageplay, or Baroness Von Bon Bon's decadent palace in Vanguard. The Netflix adaptation of Cuphead does a good job fleshing these motivations out in an acute detail. Take Ribby and Croaks, the boxing glove bearing brothers who own a lavish club, which we learn was a dream they pursued to please their ostensibly late mother, who wanted to see her boys rise past the brutishness and mud they knew so long and become respectable frogs within society. Not even the devil's own right-hand man, King Dice, is safe from the temptation to double down and finds himself at the devil's mercy. And when you're above the people you exploit, he quickly learns that risking that position to potentially join them can be a fate scarier than death. All of this set dressing is to say that every boss encounter in Cuphead is a motivated classic fight cartoon. Note how constantly Cuphead is completely dwarfed by his opposition, precisely the way the physical odds are stacked against characters like Jerry and Tweety Bird, who just like the player when possessing Cuphead, need to use patience, quick wit, and strategy to overcome their predator, while the towering boss foe will repeatedly up the ante, transform and adapting their tactics as they grow more desperate to leave this battle with their soul intact. Escalation is the principle that makes a fight cartoon so rewarding to invest in, as a character's limits are pushed to resort to their most absurd of cartoon violence and find that still isn't enough to overcome their opponent. Most Cuphead battles fall an emotional arc of a character confident such a diminutive foe won't cause them trouble, only to gradually find themselves leaning on everything in their arsenal in the hopes that some scatter shot will rid them of their assailant. The bosses of Cuphead feel cut from the same cloth as the cartoon icons who influence them as they mirror these heel characters not just in zany tactics, but in surprising sympathy, in that just as easy as it is to imprint upon your player character and his survival, you're well aware, somewhere in your mind, that these characters are just trying to survive and defend themselves. Just as badly as Wile E. Coyote needs to eat to survive, every boss in Cuphead has their soul at stake when confronted, and as amazing as it feels to finally outsmart your foe, after learning and inferring so much about them, it's hard not to feel a bit sorry for them. Of course, everyone wants character designs in their game to be memorable and endearing, but as a kid who sympathized way more with Waddle Dees than was productive for someone in the role of eating them, we've all experienced when a design is so endearing we don't want to stomp them into Koopa Dust, just as we've all sympathized with the hungry beast of prey in a chase cartoon. And it's this weirdly specific but resonating twist of these two experiences that makes the rogues gallery of Cuphead unlike any other. 
Considering the sheer volume of video game and cartoon references in Cuphead, I can only imagine that this was a feeling at least somewhat shared by the talented people who made the game, whose passion and efforts can be felt through every character's inventive, determined, if not ill-fated endeavor to survive over Cuphead. I mentioned before that as the perspective of cartoons grows more meta, we've seen these classic rivalries perceive their dynamic as co-workers, necessary evils, or even reluctant friends. Something very earnestly brought to a head in Cuphead's good ending scenario, where he saves the souls of every rogue he's encountered after beating the devil, and goes from the hunter of Inkwell's debtors to their hero. Every opponent Cuphead defeated before, no matter how sinister they are in or outside the realm of battle, how much or how little they'd get along, have a moment of shared freedom from the devil, in a way that feels downright therapeutic like wish fulfillment, and maybe if Tom, Wiley, and Pluto received the same compassion, they'd join together too, as if the devil was the very thing causing the world of cartoons to be a violent hellscape. But the more I think about it, I wouldn't have it any other way.